I didn't want to be that kid that just goes back and starts working for his family business because of the easy thing. I said, you know what? If I'm going back to CSP, I'm going back because I've proven success at Cisco. I'm going back because I have an MBA from Duke. I, I would, be, If my last name wasn't Riddick, just because I was the boss of Slack, I could still go and be hired here because of my accomplishments, not just because of my last name. And that was really important for me. Welcome to Now That's It, Stories of MSP Success, where we dive into the journeys of some of the trailblazers in our industry to find out how they used their passion for technology to help turn managed services into the thriving sector it is today. Stephen Riddick, thank you very much for being uh, on the Now That's It podcast. Great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, so you're the president of CSP Incorporated, a Raleigh Durham managed service provider that delivers customized IT services and solutions to unique business problems. We're actually in the Enable offices today in Raleigh Durham, so thank you for driving so far <laughs> to get here. Easy trip for me, exactly. <laughs> right down the road. You got it. Awesome. Thanks, bud. So uh, before we get into your MSP, why don't we talk a little bit about your start in IT and, and subsequently just your start in business? Yeah. So I actually took a, a very winding path, if you will. I was a liberal arts major in college. I was a history and economics major. Uh, I had IT in my background. My, this is actually, it's a family business, so I just put the record straight. So sort of grew up around CSP. My dad started it. But I had a little bit of a contrarian streak, I think, for a while where I didn't necessarily just want to be that kid who went straight to the family business. So I thought I, I was thinking about law school for a while. I went right out of college. I got my real estate license. I was thinking about commercial real estate development, uh, all different kinds of routes. But again, I had that. I was a history and econ major. and But I do think deep down, I always knew I, I had a nagging. I don't know. Somewhere deep down, I think I knew it might have been in me. So actually, I did hand up again after I graduated. And sorry, long-winded answer. But after I graduated, I graduated in 2004. And I took the LSATs for law school. I took the GMATs thinking about business school. Uh, I got my real estate license. And also, I guess I have an affinity for politics, or I used to. Now I'm sort of jaded by it. But I worked on a campaign through the fall, and it was an election year. And then in November, campaign was over. So, man, what do I do now? Well, I love to ski. So uh, I put everything in my car. didn't know anybody out west, but I drove to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And uh, what was going to be just a few weeks as a ski bum turned into a couple years. Um, but the reason I tell that story, though, is because still, even then, deep down, I think I knew I wanted to do something much bigger. So a lot of ski bums might just be waiting tables. I actually got a job as a concierge at the Four Seasons. And I say that because that was an incredible learning opportunity. The Four Seasons is just the epitome of service delivery and how you treat customers. And they charged so much at that point. It was uh, over $1,000, which at that age was a ton for these rooms. And it's how do you deliver the customer service experience to justify that rate? So that really was a foundation, the customer service much more than the technology. Um, and then after that, I came back and I said, you know what? I, I do think I didn't want to just come back and start working for my dad, but let me see what this technology thing's all about. So I uh, interviewed with Cisco and was able to get into, well, actually, a did not get into their uh, sales training program the first year, and it sort of frustrated me. I went to a, a good school, Wake Forest, and good grades and everything else. I don't know if they didn't trust me after being a ski bum, but I uh, went and worked my tail off in marketing at Cisco for a year and then reapplied and got in, and that's sort of how I got into technology. That's great. So your fa as you mentioned, your father has this business that you, you grew up while he was running this business. Um, how... How early on did he start having a conversation with you? Were you in high school where he said, hey, I'd love for you. You're more than welcome to join the business. Or did he know early on that you were going to go to college and sort of figure it out for yourself? Yeah, great question. And I think a little bit of both. I mean, I, I, my dad and I have an incredible relationship. And I actually worked even in high school some. I would do some shipping and receiving. At that point, it wasn't a managed service provider, but we did a lot of contracts with the state for print, what sort of turned into managed print before it was even managed print. But um, so I would do deliveries, I would do shipping and receiving, and I even was painting the parking lot one summer, I think, uh, the lines in the parking lot. So I was around the business. But then when it came time to go to college, he never put any pressure on me at all. And then even getting out, it was, he really didn't want me to, con like I said, I, did, I was a contrarian, I didn't want to go right back into it. And he really did push me, hey, Go back, go out, do your own thing for a little bit. I want you to come back because you really want to, not just because it's an easy thing to do. And I think that was really my mindset as well. Yeah, that's great. I've uh, it was interesting. I had a very similar upbringing. 
Uh, my father didn't uh, own a business, but he was always pushing me like, hey, you go into this business or you should go to school for this or whatever. And I felt like getting that degree was really, really important because that was where you figure out a good portion of your life. I mean, not everybody uses their college degree, but you learn a lot of great um, um, skills when you're in college, right? Survival skills, if you will. And so you you graduate from this fantastic university in Wake Forest and you have an opportunity again to go work for your father or work somewhere else and you decide to pick up and do something else. So uh, what was what were you looking for? Think about back when you were graduating college. Um, the easy decision for a lot of people would have been, all right, I got this great job. This is my dad's got a successful company. Go work for him. Even with him saying, no, go figure out your thing. What was what did you need? What were you sort of looking for coming out of college that that maybe you eventually found out in the ski slopes or wherever it was? You know, and I think there there are a few different angles there. And I think one thing for me, um, and looking back, I don't know if, if this is the best answer, but I didn't want to be that kid that just goes back and starts working for his family business because of the easy thing. I wanted to go back. I wanted to prove myself, prove that I could do it on my own, and ultimately go back because I have the resume and I have the skill set where I can be a value add. And uh, both internally and externally, I think with – I it just it sort of was an inner drive of mind where – um, I wanted to prove that I could do it on my own and not just sort of be yeah. the easy, take the easy path. Yeah. That says something about you, Stephen. I, I, that, I remember you telling this story at one of our business transformation programs, and it was so impactful that I've always wanted to stay in, in touch with you because I feel like, um, you've got this, um, you, you've got this complexity to you that is like, look, uh, I'm confident in myself but I don't want it to be like it was given to me, right? I want it, I want it to be earned, right? And so um, I always love that. And and you've everything that I've seen you do in your career has definitely been earned. So so I love that. Congrats on that. Well done. So 2006, I think, was the time frame. Um, you're sort of out of college. You've done a couple of things, and and you go and and you become you join Cisco, right? You you become an account manager at Cisco, um, and they didn't just throw you into the field or. I mean, they put you through a very extensive training program. You just talked about that. You had to apply to get into the pl training program. And so talk a little bit about that. You you joined Cisco, and, and what was that like working at this enterprise? Of course. Uh, man, I learned so much at Cisco, and I have nothing but incredible things to say about Cisco. Um, I mean, I think John Chambers was one of my first heroes of business, and I still uh, – yeah, I, I, he's an incredible uh, leader and visionary and and – so yeah, I love Cisco. For me, I think it was really unique. So Cisco sales training program, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but they brought in about 60 or 80 people. And um, their whole, for the sales side, they did not want anybody who had been in technology nor in sales. And I, looking back, I think it was partly because probably they wanted to be able to, I hate to use the word brainwash, but they wanted yeah. to be able to teach us their way. And they yeah. didn't want anybody coming in with any preconceived notions on what to know or expect or how to approach sales. So it was, um, you applied and it was a bunch of, you had to be a year or two out of college. And I think that's actually why I didn't get in the first round is because I had taken that ski bum route. And I think they're like, well, where are his priorities? But then I, again, I, I said, well, Hey, what else can I do? And I got into marketing, I actually drove a van around for a year going to different expos and all that just was full of Cisco gear and I would demo at that point, it was phone systems. They were going all in on phones and I was demoing call manager in the back of a van. And so I did that a year for, I think, to really show my commitment to them. And unfortunately, with some of the relationships, I was able to get into the program the next year. But I think one of the great things for me is, A, I think that it, it was some humble pie for me. Uh, and I learned the technology well, but also I think just having a couple more age, a couple more years of maturity under me. When I went into that program, um, and I just have some amazing friends that I still keep up with, and so many people have done so many things. But I was just about three years older. But when you're 21, three years is sort of a big difference. And plus, I lived here. A lot of the kids who came in all lived in apartments right by Cisco, and it was sort of a party, candidly. But at this point, I was I was living with some high school buddies closer to home, but we were a little bit older. So I went in with the mindset of, man, I want to learn everything. I want to be the absolute best that I can be. And because of that, they they do metrics and all, and I don't mean it's an arrogant way, but I finished, I think, in almost everything near the top of the class, and really, I think, I positioned myself for success from there. And so you come in for about a year, and more or less, you're getting paid to get a PhD in selling and a PhD in Cisco, and uh, it, was, it was just an incredible experience. Yeah, so I was just going to say, skating by is not 
you know, one of your uh, characteristics, right? So you finished at the top of the training program. What did that mean to you to be sort of number one in that class? You know, I, I don't know. I, again, I'm not, a. I'm extremely competitive, uh, inwardly, but I'm not an outwardly, uh, you know, I, I, again, for me, it was more the pride of the stepping stone to be able to then go out in the field and have great success in the field as well. Uh, more than being able to pat myself on the back or anything like that. Gotcha. So, uh, I, uh, I heard that you were, you did very well at Cisco, uh, slaying it, if you will, on the sales side. Um, what were some of those characteristics or those habits that, that maybe you learned over the years of working in the field at Cisco that you were able to, to carry with you, uh, into, to your company now? Yeah. I mean, so many things I think, I mean, Cisco is just led by John Chambers an enterprise sales engine. And I mean, right from day one, you go out there and my, my first boss, who was a, a true mentor to me when I went out into the field, um, you know, sort of said in lack of better terms, hey, I see, quote unquote, hot shots like you all the time. But hey, now in sales, your number is your number. And you got to produce. And I think just the expectation that comes with every single week, giving that commit, hey, what are you committing this week, knowing your business, uh, standing up in front of your peer groups, being stacked ranked, et cetera, et cetera, uh, was instilled with me from the start. And I, I guess I thought that was some really good skills that I still take with me today of just, uh, hey, how, how sales is running a big organization. So. That's great. Very good. So what was it like to work for an international enterprise? I mean, it's a lot different, right, than where you're at today, but... What did it feel like to be, you know, uh, just sort of spread across the world? I mean, do you ever feel disconnected with people that you work with or, or what's the experience like? Yeah. Um, you know, as big as it is also is as small as you make it as well. And, and I think for me, I mean, I was at this point living down in Atlanta um, covering the, the public sector in Georgia. And so, again, I think even in that, you can, you can make it a, a smaller experience. I think one of the things that I don't think I appreciated enough, just from a strictly from a sales standpoint, it's honestly, it's easy. Because just the name Cisco, they could care less who I am, but I could call any of my clients, even if they had never bought Cisco, and say, hey, I'm your new Cisco rep, and I could get a meeting. I could get a meeting with the CIO, with anybody, just because I was their Cisco rep, and they wanted to know what was going on. So I think getting your foot in the door was uh, easier, maybe, than an MSP, just because you have the name recognition at Cisco. Yeah. Coming to then an, an MSP side, you don't have that same name, name recognition. So I think that was one thing that I maybe took a little bit for granted initially. Um, but I think the resources that you have because of that, again, just an incredible learning experience. What I was sitting in, and not just not anything that I did, but just because of my name, my company, and I could call in international resources or take clients out to San Jose to the executive briefing center or uh, just have all of these subject matter experts at my fingertips. And really, in a lot of ways, at that point, I'm just the quarterback. I'm just trying to get the right resource to talk to the right person with the client uh, to really just move things to the next step of the sales process where you just sort of quarterback it through, but you have an unlimited amount of resources, which is just very helpful. That's amazing. So you spent, I think, almost six years or about six years at Cisco. What made you realize that it might be time to go and work at CSP with your dad? Yeah, and I think there were, there were a couple things going, going on simultaneously. One, I, I just, I'm a sponge and I just, I love to learn and always yearning to learn more. And at Cisco, I had had two incredible managers, and as I mentioned, and they were both mentors. And one, one thing that I really loved is that they both approached sales totally different. Uh, my first manager was a gentleman, David Midkiff, and he was just a relational um, a relational salesperson, just build, he could connect with anybody, build an amazing relationship, and that was sort of his sales approach. Uh, my next manager, Matt, was much more sort of data numbers driven, deep in the numbers. And they both worked and they both worked extremely well. And it's like, okay, well, hey, what are some nuggets I can take from David's approach? What are some nuggets I can take from Matt's approach? And then I got to the point too, when I was getting my 30s, I had always sort of had a, a yearning um, to go back to school. I intentionally was in college. I, I was, like I said, a liberal arts major. And one of the reasons I didn't do business undergrad, because I think I always knew deep down I wanted to go back and get my MBA. And I said, you know what? I don't want to just get an undergrad business to then go back and get graduate business. No. And I, I love the liberal arts. I think liberal arts teaches you, and I know liberal arts are under assault right now, but 
one of the biggest values. It teaches you how to think. It teaches you how to co communicate, how to comprehend things. And so I wouldn't trade that for the world, but I still then wanted to have uh, some of that true business tactical understanding. So um, again, I was probably six years in and I had, uh, again, fortunately seen some great success. I felt like I had learned a ton and just saying, all right, hey, what, what is next? And if I'm going to do something, obviously my dad's getting older, maybe now is the time. And so I applied to some executive MBA programs, was lucky enough to get into Duke and I was still living in Atlanta and it was a weekend program where every other weekend would come back and do a long weekend in Durham. And so it was traveling back and forth and sort of similar to Cisco at this point. I was just such a dork. I wish I would have been like this in undergrad, but I just wanted to learn as much as I could and soak it all in. And then as this is happening, I said, you know what, if I'm going back to CSP, um, sort of where I started a few minutes ago, I'm going back because I've proven success at Cisco. Yeah. I'm going back because I have an MBA from Duke. I, I would, be, if my last name wasn't Riddick, just because I was the boss of son, I could still go and be hired here because of my accomplishments, not just because of my last name. And that was really important for me. That's good. So you interviewed for the position at CSP. Was that your decision or was that your dad's decision? No, I, I, you know, I think it was both both of us. And I think because he was a, he was the same as me. You know, nothing was ever forced, but you know, I think we were always in alignment that hey, he didn't want. I think he also saw a value in. Uh, CSP of me going to a place like Cisco, learning and being able to bring new ideas and not just sort of coming in and, and sort of doing things the CSP way, but rather be able to have that expertise. So, you know, I mean, it wasn't a formalized interview, but it was more of a, hey, what have you learned? What do you think there's some, how do you think you could impact us? What are some value you could bring? Yeah. So you took over, I think you were, uh, v you became VP of sales and marketing there. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of where CSP was when you joined and, and maybe what you saw as an opportunity to improve with the sales and marketing, the go to market size of that Definitely. side of the house? Yeah. And so actually I, I came in first, I did it and I can't remember the exact dates, but a couple of years just as an account manager, as a salesperson. And, you know, like a lot of MSPs, um, you know, I think we've transitioned, heck, we started when we started and we're a, started in 1995. So sort of CSP 1.0 was more of the, the hardware, the mainframe, you know, again, we were doing a lot of printer maintenance, hardware maintenance, um, that kind of stuff. And then we pivoted um, more into that, that VAR mindset. So again, at one point we were doing a ton of Cisco where I think we were even a Cisco small business part of the year in the Southeast one year. Um, and then the, that pivot again to managed services. And I think when I joined, to be completely blunt, I, I think we were trying to sort of do both. And I think we were a little stuck in the middle um, and we were doing both okay, but we hadn't really, again, we were we were going managed services, but we still had this sort of legacy VAR and it's how do, how do you play it together? And uh, so honestly, when I became then sales manager, I mean, I kept seeing the MRR and what we got to go more MRR, got to go in more MRR, but also we had this legacy we were trying to protect and we had some salaries that, man, we had to have the project business. And I'll admit it got tight there for a few years just because, I mean, by definition, the MRR is builds upon itself, but used to when, let's just say we were selling, let's just say a classic Cisco phone system, let's say it was a decent sized deal. Maybe that's a hundred thousand dollar deal that we'd be getting right there from the start Whereas we sell a hosted solution and, you know, maybe you're getting 3K, 4K a month. And you figure over a five year period, you're going to end up making more. But also in the real time and short term, man, that's a big hit when you're taking a hundred K thousand dollar deal versus, you know, uh, just some labor and a four K dollar thousand dollar deal. So there were some as we pivoted, it got tight. And I kept just sort of having to tell about, hey, trust, hey, as we're building up this MRR just trust us. We can see sort of that roadmap, uh, that path out. But uh, yeah, it was tight there for a bit. So, but you ran sales for a number of years yeah. and um, there were some things that you learned and, and things that you sort of massaged or changed or redirected. But what were some of your takeaways, Stephen, over those, your, your time in sales that, that really stuck with you? Yeah. You know, I think for me, my I have a couple mantras for sales, but I think the biggest one, and, and honestly, I think it goes back to Cisco is that sales is just such a numbers game. And I'm just such a believer in the funnel that you got to just throw as much as you possibly can into the funnel. 
And if you just do, let's just do easy math here. But, you know, a salesperson, you're going to have small close rates. And the best salesperson versus the worst salesperson is by accident, you're going to be closing deals. So let's say that you've thrown a million dollars just for round numbers into that pipe. And let's say you have a salesperson that is maybe closing 10% of that. So let's just say 100K. Um Wait, hold on. Sorry, I'm, I'm not giving that analogy well. Let's say, so yeah, let's say, but then, all right, then let's say that you have somebody, let's say they're an awesome salesperson. So let's say they have a million in the pipe. Let's say they're even at a 20% close rate, which for new business would be huge. So 200K. Versus let's say on the other hand that you have somebody that maybe isn't even as good a salesperson, but they're just out there hunting. They're going so hard and they've thrown 10 million in the dollar, 10 million in the pipe but they're a 10% close rate. That number is going to be bigger at the end of the day. So it's really just how much can you throw in at the top? And then just from there, look at the numbers. All right, so if we're throwing in a lot of top, well, are we getting a lot of proposals out the door? Well, if you're throwing a ton in the top, but you're not getting a lot of proposals out the door, then, hey, let's work on how we're qualifying. Let's work on the questions we're asking. Let's work on trying to identify, asking the right questions. And then if you're getting the pipe, the initial pipeline, you're getting the proposals, but you're not closing. Well, then, you know, hey, it's a closing issue. So, hey, what do we need to do? What kind of closing questions do we need to ask? What do we need to do to get this over the finish line? But uh, it really just becomes a numbers game at that point. Yeah. So you already talked about a couple of these things, but you've, you've worked in sales in both a, a, an MSP and a non-MSP. What's something you think MSPs might be doing incorrectly when it comes to sales? And you, you talked about a couple of, of the ways, the activity and, and what their pipe looks like. But, you know, maybe just from a general sales perspective, what do you, what do you think some MSPs might not be considering that, that you may have seen at the corporate side or, or at your MSP today? I think there are a couple things. One is I really try to, as a sales leader, try to lean into what made that salesperson successful and not just be so prescriptive of, hey, this is the way. And obviously we have a framework and a sales process. Um, well, so I'm going to actually take two different approaches. Because one, that sales process, I think that is the biggest thing. I think understanding your process and realizing that, hey, when you're making that first call, you're not trying to close a deal. I've seen so many salespeople think that, oh, I'm a salesperson. So they pick up a phone and they're trying to like close on the first call. It's like, no, just follow your process. That first call, all you're trying to do is get a meeting. You honestly don't want to spend too much time on the phone with them because if you're spending too much time on the phone with them, that's going to give them an opportunity for a no. So just try to get that first meeting. Then in that first meeting, don't try to sell anything. Just listen. Just ask a ton of questions. Try to identify needs. And just keep moving in along until ultimately at the end, if you have followed that process and you've identified budget, you know who's signing, you know who the key players are, you know the timeline, you know what the blockers are, if you check all the boxes, by the time you get to that signature, it's like, okay, well, Mr. Client, you know, I learned all this. We've checked every single box. Here you go. Getting the signatures is the easy part at that point. Um, and I think a lot of salespeople struggle. And again, they're just trying to sell too early. Whereas, no, just follow the process. Yeah, that's good, Stephen. So I, I laugh because this is not you, but I call this next section, I'm kind of a big deal. <laughs> and this is all about you sort of taking over. So at some point in time, uh, either over family meals or during some meetings, some company sessions, your dad had sort of said, like, I want to step back. I, I want to move you into, uh, you know, take over as president. Um, were you ready for that challenge? Is that something that you had sort of seen over the over the years and and he started to groom you or was that a little bit of a, a surprise? No, I think I, I was yeah. I was definitely ready for it. And even. Um to me, I, and I, I was ready for it personally as well, just because I love to lead. Uh, and, and don't I don't want anybody to take this the wrong way. I mean, I love technology. I love manning services. But for me, I love to build things. I love to lead people. I mean, it goes back to you know high school. I was president. I was super involved in student government. I was president of clubs and president of school. I mean, in college, I was president of my fraternity. Um, so I think I've just always, I, I love leading people, and I love trying to help people. I love being a servant leader. Um, so from that side of it, I think it just sort of fell in. Um, and then again, with the background, some of the things I'd done, I think that step was just very easy and natural for me. And then on the family business side, yes, I, th I think as well. I think just we got to a point where my dad was saying, man, I, I want to slowly start phasing back. And we have a great learner. He's still involved. And, and I love that. And I want him to be. But uh, at least on the day to day, he is taking a little bit of a step back. He's a great guy. I've gotten to know him. He loves his barbecue. Yeah, he does. Uh, definitely <laughs> critiques the barbecue when you bring yeah. it in. Um, so when you took over as, as president, obviously, you had been involved in the business for a number of years already. And you had made some, ch made some changes. But 
being in that role as sort of I'm in charge now or or it's my call, was there anything that you were looking to do either right away or over that first, you know, six to eight months? So any sort of big changes or at least, you know, changes just to just to rearrange things or, or anything like that? Anything you could think of? Yeah. Um, you know, I'd spend a lot of time thinking about that because I, I really I love business. And, and again, it's sort of a puzzle to me. And how can we sort of unleash the power of this? So but also I'm a realist and I think that, um, you know, so much of leadership, I, I sort of went on a listening tour, honestly. And, and obviously I've been around for a while. I knew everybody, but just tried to go, you know, now in a different role, you know, get a pulse of what's going on. And I think the biggest thing, and not that this wasn't happening, but really just empowering people and listening and trusting them to go execute and trying to really just set some uh, big picture, top level goals. Hey, here's what we want to accomplish. Um, I think like a lot of companies, we could, and we still can get in a tendency of trying to knock out 10 different things and maybe doing all of them okay, as opposed to that saying, hey, what are a few big rocks and let's go execute on those biggest rocks. Let's knock them out and then let's go on to a few more big rocks. Yeah. Very good. Good EOS reference there <laughs> exactly. uh, for those of you MSPs listening that that uh, haven't done any research on that. Um, so obviously lots of response, lots of different responsibilities as president way more than when you were leading the sales team. And and I assume you still have your eye on the sales side of the business. I know you were on a call before this, this meeting. So you're, as you rightfully should, you are, you are, they are buying you now, right? You're the face of the company. Your dad was for years and the Riddick name, you're, you're that face. So you're still very much involved, but let me ask you of all the responsibilities and the roles, what's the thing that gets you the most excited? What do you wake up every day going, I, I can't wait to do this or be part of this? Oh man, I, I'm such a vision strategy guy. I love thinking where, where are we trying to get to? And, um, you know, two, three, five years down the road, where do I think we need to go? And again, I'm also competitive and I, I love winning. So I love to be able to see, um, us taking steps to get there. So I think that that's definitely what excites me the most. And then also though, I am a culture, I'm a relationship guy. I love just making those connections with our employees. I mean, I'm such a big believer in our vision is to leave a positive lasting impact on our people, our clients and our community. And to me, in my mind, it's got, it has, it's very deliberate that our people are first. And we just got to leave an impact on them. And I'm a realist. I'm not from an age where I expect people to work with us for 50 years and get a Rolex at the end and ride off into the sunset after a big you know, retirement party. But saying, hey, how can we grow and build up the individuals in our team? And if it works for them to be at CSP for a while, great. But hey, if I grow somebody to the point and maybe they've outgrown us and they go on and have an awesome career somewhere else, then I've done my job as well. So I just I love that those relationships and trying to groom success for everyone. That's awesome. I, I bet you you're a really fun guy to work for too. You seem like you bring a lot of energy and positivity to the job on a daily basis. So, uh, so keep up that, that, uh, mantra there, that good work you've got. So you decided like many MSPs to join a peer group with MSPs that were sort of similar maturity. Yeah. Why was that so important for CSP at the time you did? And, and what's that sort of meant for you over the, over the couple of years? Yeah, it's been an incredible opportunity for me. And I mean, we've been a part of some, my dad had been a part of some and got me engaged in the past. Um, but again, I was more on the periphery of those. And then I think when COVID hit, obviously everything sort of blew up and everybody sort of batting down the hatches and it's sort of, all right, let's get through this. And that then sort of timed with then coming out of that, then when I became president and said, all right, hey, I think this is something I really want to re-engage in. And the value to me has just been instrumental. I think I, I like I reference, I'm a sponge. I love to learn and I hope I have a few good ideas to share with the peer group, but just the uh, trust, camaraderie, the accountability that it brings and seeing what some just incredible MSPs are doing and hopefully just take, uh, no offense, but yes, you know, borrow a great idea or two. Well, hopefully I can do the same with them. It has been just enormous for us. The thing that I loved about you joining the, uh, the in-person peer group that we have here at Enable was um, you, were, you weren't the original founding member of that group. You had to be let in. And so one of the things you had to do was sort of interview or try out. And you had prepared so well for that that I think, you know, I sat with the group afterwards and they're like, 
yeah, that's a, <laughs> this is a no brainer. You had done such a good job and, and sort of conveyed what you were trying to get out of it and what you had done with the company. And so I think that's funny you mentioned that. I really thought it was a rubber. When I asked to do that, I yeah. thought it was a rubber stamp approval, yeah. but oh, okay. I, I still wanted to prepare yeah. and, uh, and for me, it was a great exercise, though, because, again, it forced me. I think all of us as business leaders, it's so easy to get stuck in the business and that day to day just responsive in the business. And I think that really forced me to come out of the business and really think through. I wanted to be able to share with them, hey, here's my vision. Also, it forced me to be focused on the business a little bit. And it turned out that, again, I guess it wasn't a rubber stamp, but I'm glad So I'm glad I spent the time on it. Well done. <laughs> you, it, it, it stuck with me. That's how well it was done. So great job. Uh, so I've gotten to know you over the last few years uh, through some of the, the relationship, really, that you've had with Enable and, and, and really the partnership that you have with Enable. And so let me just ask you, talk about how important or why uh, partnerships are so important to CSP. Definitely. Um, so I, we now go by CSP, but our name is Computer Service Partners was our original. And we ultimately went CSP. It just sounded a little antiquated, like break, fix, but partners. And so much, again, going back to our vision um, and our mission, it's developing partnerships. One of our core principles is personalize it. You know, we're in an industry that so much of what we can do can be done remotely, can be done via an automation. But I'm still, we're in North Carolina. I'm still a big believer that people buy from people, that people work with people. And it's all about cultivating those relationships. And um, honestly, I, and I'm not saying this just because you invited me in today, but when I look at where Enables come here in the past few years, I feel like there's much more of that. Uh, and the relationship and the partnership that we have, we feel like it is a true partnership as opposed to candidly, some of the other vendors right now, maybe we don't feel like that as much. We feel like we're maybe just a number or just sort of a mechanism to go sell, but uh, yeah, very high on enable for that partnership. Appreciate that. And it goes both ways. Like it's incredibly valuable to get your feedback on what we're doing, both through the product as well as through some of the programs that we run. And so it's been great to have folks like you, uh, partners like you really share. So it's awesome. Yeah. All right. So, uh, last couple questions here, talk a little bit about the, um, sort of where CSP is today and maybe the outlook for the future. Where do you have any sort of, um, goals, uh, or, you know, rocks yep. that you have identified that you're hoping to, 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 to take care of over the next couple of years? Yeah. So, I mean, where we are now is, uh, man, I'm just so proud of our team. We've, I think, uh, and nothing that I've done, but since I became president, I think we're up, uh, you know, 30, 35% or so top line. So, I mean, there's been some great growth that we're, we're very proud of. I mean, our big theme though, this year is the foundation. Cause I mean, I really want to keep growing. I want to keep growing a lot. And, um, I, another expression I love is what got you here can't get you there. And I think, you know, we've unlocked a few things to get us here, but now to get us there, I think we need to unlock more. And really, we got to build more of a foundation for scalability. I think um, everyone on our team cares so much. And I think we've been able to let hard work get us here. We, we will outwork anybody and we'll build those great relationships. But I think to truly scale it, uh, there's a lot more we need to do from an operational efficiency standpoint. Another reason I've loved the peer group is because they've given me so many ideas and I see how great some of these MSPs are when it comes to their operational efficiency. So, uh, and also sales too. I mean, I think with our sales, uh, really across the board, long story short, we just need to continue to build a scalable foundation that can really just push us to even greater heights. That's great. I'm confident you guys are going to do that and I wish you the best of luck there. So, uh, what advice would you give to younger Steven, maybe ski bum Steven or, or even before that, now that you, uh, have gotten to where you are today? Man, I really think, um, you know, I try not to look back a ton. I try not to live with any regret. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, here's the, oh, this, I'm going to go very small and tactical here. Yeah. I have a cousin who I'm super close with, and he lived, he was working with Caterpillar out of school, and he was living in Beijing, and me and his brother and another one of our cousins, we're going to try to take like a two-week trip uh, one summer to go visit him and do all of Southeast Asia. He was living in Beijing, so we had a tour guide built in. For whatever reason, I was 25. I was at Cisco making good money. I could afford it. I think it was honestly like summer, so Cisco's Q4. 
And I'm just like, God, sorry, I can't pull this off. And that is a huge, re- that's probably the only regret yeah. I have. It's like, yeah. you know, looking back, why in the world didn't it just get in and uh, take that go trip. travel? That's exactly. Right. Take so, that trip. Sorry, that's not, not what you're looking for, but that is, that is one no, that I'll go with. I think that's good advice because I think a lot of um, business owners or, or even, you know, folks that are trying to move up in the world, they say no to a lot of stuff that are missed experiences. And so I think that was one of the the best pieces of advice that I ever got early on is work hard, but play hard. Yeah. Enjoy I'm your in. life. Enjoy the time because life is short. And, you know, you, you, you know, you never know that that you may not get to try, take that trip yeah. again. So I think that's good advice for, for sure, Stephen. All right. So we like to ask this question okay. to every single one of our guests. And uh, and I didn't tell you that I was going to ask this question. Right. So so I'm hoping that this doesn't stump you. Oh, but man. This is what uh, the name of the podcast is the Now That's It podcast. Yep. So I like to ask everybody, when did you know Now That's It? Man. I'm going to take a, a different direction there, too. I really, I mean, I, I think my family having kids, uh, get married and having kids. To me, that is, I, I love... Uh, what we're doing at CSP mm-hmm. and I'm so proud of what we're doing at CSP, but I truly do. I work to live and not live to work. And, uh, you know, for me, that's it when it comes to the family and those experiences that you reference, having fun with them, raising that family, just incredible. That's important. And, and maybe, uh, the type of father you are, the type of leader that you are, maybe you inspire them to work for you someday and take over the business, right? So, so this could be the beginning of, of the next phase you know, of, of CSP. So that's great. Stephen, thank you so very much for being here today. This is always a pleasure talking to you. I love hearing your stories. Uh, I wish you and the rest of the team, your dad, I wish you guys the best of luck. Well, thank you, Chris. And thank you for the invitation and a great to spend some time with you. Sounds great. Yeah.